Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And I'm so excited to be diving into talking about Prodigal Son today with creators and showrunners, Christopher Fedak and Sam Sclaver. Um, and I wanted to start by asking you about the way in which you wrapped up season one, because I know that shooting out of order and having to shoot a lot of Michael Sheen's um, moments and scenes early on allowed you to really bridge the gap for the two or three episodes that you weren't actually able to film because of the COVID shutdown, but was really fascinated in how you kind of reconstructed the narrative because in watching it, it completely flows. It never feels like there's any loose ends that weren't tied up. And obviously you were doing that with the footage that you already had. So how did you kind of approach stepping back, looking at what you had filmed and reconstructing what that narrative was gonna look like when you were in that moment? Uh, well, we were terrified and with fear in our eyes, we said, well, <laughs> we got to do something. We, we shot a finale with Michael Sheen. That's awesome. And it was the it was this week in March. Right, Chris, like yeah. Friday, the 13th was when we shut down. And I think a few days earlier from that, as you're saying, we had shot our finale which was our episode 22, and we had already shot our episode 21, and we were now going back in time and shooting our episode 18, which mm -hmm. in our storyline was very important. Nicholas Endicott, Dermot Mulroney, was supposed to be in five episodes for us with a very healthy arc. And all of a sudden we were like, okay, this man that Jessica Whitley met and is charming, now we're going to have to kill him and we're going to need to make. And so we really did, uh, along with the writers, we, we, that week in March, very early in the week, we were like, we were like, I don't know that we're going to be able to shoot all of this. We not, we might not. And then as the hours ticked by, we were like, we might only be able to shoot for one more day. Mm -hmm. So we really, oh, go ahead, Chris, why don't you? Oh, no, no, I was just going to say it happened over the course of just a few days where it was just like we, we, we like everybody else, you know, we're kind of like mm -hmm. seeing the world change in real time. You know, from what we were hearing on set, I was just been in New York and had flown back and it was just, you know, it was deteriorating. So like Sam and I were like, mm -hmm. from our perspective, it was like, how do we make sense of this thing? So essentially we have two, we had two episodes that we had to film. And like Sam said, we had a five episode arc for Dermot Mulroney and we, mm -hmm had to turn two episodes into two scenes. And then we were lucky to get those two scenes. So the next day we were like, guys, we're gonna shoot one more day and then we're gonna wrap and get out of here. And we turned those two episodes into two scenes. Dermot Mulroney became a bad guy very quickly. And, and, we, and, 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 and we went to the cast and we said, you know, we think if we have this stuff, we can, we can, we can make the season work. And luckily, and our crew and our team were like, Let, let's do it, let's get it. And, and it all came together. But it was very much like a, every part of the process was, was, was tricky. Not only like writing it, because we like went into the writer's room at lunchtime and said, hey, hey guys, how would we do this in theory? And then, you know, the, the teams, you know, writers being professional television, you know, television professionals were like, well, we could do this, this, and this. And then when, you know, 15 minutes later, we were like, let's do that. And then 15 minutes later, the studio was like, hey, we don't know if we're going to get to finish. And they were like, we got a plan. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, some, it, especially working in network TV where you have very um, tight turnarounds, you have to kind of be able to kind of move and make moves. And so um, we were lucky we were able to do that. We had a good team that could do it. Yeah. And in terms of writing season two and, and going into a remote writer's room, how did that create new and interesting challenges? Because obviously, you know, so much of, of how a writer's room functions is like that fast paced dynamic and group conversations, but kind of break off smaller one on ones and and ideas just kind of like really flowing and being able to map things out on a wall as well. So how did you try to like recreate that as best as you could within the virtual mediums? And and what were the things that you really struggled with and what were the things that that actually worked really well in that space. Do you see the sad clown behind Sam? Yeah. That's how we feel. That's how we feel. It's like, it's like, it's, it, I mean, it, it, we, we, we've tried to do a good job. We try to you know, create a certain amount of time that we work every day. We try not to, I think, I think the, the stress of being on Zoom is quite different than being in a room with people. It's like, we're just not comfortable listening and thinking on a Zoom. It's like, cause like so much of a writer's room is actually, you got this idea and it's like floating in front of you. And like, we're all kind of throwing ideas at it and chat testing and changing it and playing with it. 
Whereas like when we're on a screen, it's not like we can just sit there in silence. People feel like they have to talk. And I, and so it's a, it's a, it's been difficult. We've, we've, we've got a great team. We're, you know, a great writing staff and we've all been able to, you know, you know, do it, do the job, but it, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not what, like, especially Sam coming from comedy. It's not what we love. It's not the, it's not the I best think way to do it. Our, our saving grace as it were, and I, I just feel so fortunate is that, all of the writers are writers from season one. You, we, we had uh, one edition in the writer's room, but I, I couldn't imagine, you know, and, this, and, and the one edition in the writer's room is this uh, writer, Marcus, we hired, who's lovely. I feel like I know him well. I've never seen the back of his head. Like, that's just a weird, <laughs> that's a weird creative thing. Like, I've had deep conversations with Marcus. I don't know if he's bald or not. Like, he, I've only seen him like this. So it's, it's, that, but that we knew everyone else in the room and that, you know, I worked with Chris on his other show, uh, uh, one of his other shows called Deception. Another one of the writers is with us from Deception, actually two of them now. So yeah. that we all know each other, I think has made it easier, but um, no, it's been terrible. <laughs> <That's> been, <laughs> Zoom rooming is no fun. They used to buy us lunch every day. Like that was the thing that writers got. We don't get lunch box. We had phones, we had offices, we had things. It's like, you know, now it's just like. Snacks throughout the day. Now you got to get your own snacks. I know it's like, it's it's hell. It's, I mean, yeah, obviously on the list of like, you know, you know, you know, sad and awful things about about 2020, not having snacks or paid for lunches is not something we would put on the list, but you know, we're writers. So we like to complain. I'd like it back. I'd like it back if possible. In term, in you know, obviously there's there's the logistical operation side of of how you have to approach filming now with a lot of safety protocols. But beyond that, has it had an impact on the way that you think about scenes now and the way that you write them, even just thinking in terms of the number of people in a room, how close are the characters going to get? What's kind of like the physical intimacy of these characters and having to kind of work around that in a different way? Has that, has that impacted any of the writing in the second season? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's funny. I was going to say no. I mean, okay. it has, like it has absolutely, mm-hmm. but I... I don't know that we'd be telling our stories any different if there wasn't COVID. You know what I mean? Because it's like, oh wait, we can't do a stunt like this. Oh wait, we we can't have this many people. But I, I only feel fortunate in that I think season two, we're telling the stories we'd probably be telling if we didn't have COVID, at least for what we wanted to do in our show. We're a very lucky show because Michael Sheen is behind the line six feet from everyone he acts with. So it, we've, we've created a socially distant show already. I think in our procedural world, it's created new challenges, mm-hmm. but often that's where a challenge is like, oh, well, what if we put her on a genie lift? And it's like, not only does that fix the challenge, but now I have an actor in a genie lift and it's like more fun. So mm-hmm. we, we've been very fortunate, I think in the show that the challenges have been astronomical and like we 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 keep but we keep finding fun new ways you know we have a very inventive crew in new york who i think have been rising to the challenge yeah i I love the idea no i I just love the idea that you've made a point it's like michael sheen is safe like listen england don't worry (laughs) michael is safe he's protected yeah by Mm -hmm. the line yes and, you know, in, in terms of, of the themes and the tonality, because you were just mentioning the procedural element of the show, and it's what's so great about the show overall is, is this amalgamation of different genres and different spaces that you bring in. You've got procedural, you've got kind of a family drama, you know, you've got undertones of comedy that, that come through in really interesting ways. When you're, when you're writing the episodes, how do you make sure that these different elements in these different genres all come together in a way that feels really cohesive and that the different tones are all serving each other and it never feels like a jump cut to like, oh, well, like, you know, we were having this like deep family emotional moment and suddenly someone's been murdered and we're trying to figure out who did it because you always manage to kind of ride the moments between those scenes and between those elements so beautifully in your writing. Well, thank you very much for saying that, but it's very much about like, you know, it's like when you're cooking and you're like, you know, it's a little bit of different flavors. It's like, you know, a little paprika comedy, a little salt for the drama. And this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of this, this metaphor as quickly as possible. But it's like, you're, 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 there's always a version of every script and story where it's like, it's a little batty. 
and then you start to adjust and you see how things kind of pull together and and I think it very much comes down to like the flavor that we're looking for which is something that Fox and Warner Brothers have been supportive of is the show is you know it's secretly comedic it's secretly funny um, it's a little twisted and like we go for delightfully disturbing and like once you know that that's your tone and like you've hired Sam and Chris to write it then it's like th th that's that's our attitude so like and like ha coming from the world of Chuck I remember back in the day you know the executives at NBC going like your tone is like this like really you can hit it only here it's, like, it's a very narrow target but like you know it's like once you know your target and I think that's what we figured out in season one it, it, it's it's a lot of fun, but like, there's always a version of every script and every episode where it's like you watch and you go like, oh boy, you know, yeah. this thing's bananas. And then we kind of dial it in and that's, that's the process. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you said that it's, it's secretly comedic and disturbing, it's, it's like the sad clown in Sam's background. <laughs> it's, it's, that clown is just staring at me and no matter where you go in your frame, that clown is watching you. I know what I'm And I'm not talking about the panty. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about the the perspective of the show because right from the beginning in that very first episode we're very much constantly seeing the worldview through Malcolm and he's kind of the central perspective for the audience but the way that you played out the first season and and where you ended it with Ainsley it feels like you know she's kind of coming into the foreground in a slightly different way so in terms of having the first season really structured kind of so solely around Malcolm's viewpoint, how did that influence the way that you approached writing scenes and, and thinking about audience perspective and character perspective? And has that shifted and changed at all with those kind of like new narrative points that you're bringing in and, and setting up in this season? It changes um, a little. But... Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, I was just gonna say that was a very smart question. I, that question was almost too smart for me. I was like, wait, what? No, I get it. Chris, Chris gets it better than I do. But I, 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 I'm just gonna. It was very, it was a very well put question. Um, yeah. I think I, I wish we had asked ourselves that question at some point exactly. as we were working on the show. Um, <laughs> no, I, you're, it, it's it. I think that for like every show, when you get into a season two and hopefully more seasons, like it allows you to deepen the show. You know, it's like we we figure out what our characters can and can't do, and and also like you know what are our, our secret skills of our our actors and you know, we have such an amazing cast that, you know, it was one of the things that we, from the get-go in season one, we knew we were kind of building toward um, uh, Ainsley, you know, killing Nicholas Syndicott and the My Girl moment at the very end of the season and, and getting Halston, who's such a delightful actress, you know, so much fun, so emotional, but also twisted and funny that we, we really wanted to build to that moment. In season two, you know, we're definitely building out her character and exploring her psychology. But the thing to keep in mind is that we're, Bright is the main character of the show. And so for him, it's like he's our detective. And sometimes that's a detective who's working in the world of a, of a mystery and a murder. And sometimes it's the detective who's just simply trying to understand the people in his life. And so I think that the way we view it is that Malcolm is our way in. And so he is the way we're going to kind of, we, we understand everything. And so Ainsley is a new mystery. What is going on inside her head? What is she thinking? You know, how is she feeling? It's like, these are things that Bright can guess at and understand, but in the way we're all mysteries to each other. So I think that's very much kind of like how we come into it in season two. It's like, we see the show as Sherlock Freud and that's the way Bright kind of addresses everything. And that's, you know, that's, that's our attitude in regard to perspective. Mm -hmm. And it feels really important that you gave Holston Sage, who plays Ainsley, that piece of information partway through the season. So she ultimately knew as well where her character was going to so that she could start layering it in and nuancing it into her character and into her performance in ways so that when she reaches that point that in watching it, it feels like a really believable character choice. And so I wanted to ask you about the way in which you work with the cast and kind of, obviously you don't have the scripts for the full season ahead of time and they're still coming together and everything's incredibly fast paced. But how does that look in terms of the, the conversations and the communication that you'd like to have with the cast and, and how you kind of work with them to give them the tools that they need so that they can build up to certain pivotal character moments in the way that you did with Holston for that? Yeah, we, we just always have to be talking to them. Mm -hmm. And it's like a lovely crew to talk to, but it's like, I think we stopped production in the middle of March 
And by the beginning of April, we were probably doing phone calls with all of them weekly or Zooms. Like if it was just to check in on how Lou Diamond Phillips was doing or speak to Bellamy or, you know, we were constantly talking to them as we were trying to figure out what our second season stories would be. You know, once when George Floyd happened and, and all of that, you know, moment that we were having with the police departments in the United States, we realized that that's something that we had to talk about in our show season two as well. But we, Chris and I have a perspective and we have thoughts, but we want to know what Frank Hart's thoughts are and what um, Aurora and Lou and all of our cops. And, and so they, they were very instrumental in us kind of figuring out the stories we want to tell. And then as we kind of then go back to the lab and figure it out in the writer's room, we're just constantly updating them as well on where we want to take their characters. And, you know, this season, like Chris was saying, it's fun because we have deepened these characters so much that like, I can tell two episodes that really just center on, uh, on Adresa. On Keiko, like I'm, I'm not, I, I can't because of our 13 episode order do that, but I know I'm going to do it for one of them. And so we decided very early, we want Keiko up front and center in a case because we just knew what we had with her. And also, like you're saying, we also realized very early, well, Ainsley has to be at the center of a, of a story, especially maybe more than one, especially how we saw her. So once we started figuring out where we were going to give each member of our cast a moment to shine, it was kind of just you know, it was figuring out where that would happen with our season and then talking to them about what we were planning on doing and getting their feedback because they're all, I mean, everyone's brilliant and we make it, it, you know, stuff just gets better. Even in the first scene that Michael came back to shoot, he was like, he asked us a very little question. It was almost like, what happened to me the day yesterday? You know, before the day that we were shooting the script and we were like, well, I don't really know. And he was like, what if? Uh, and he had this great, and then it was this, we were like, yes, let's do it. And then that first scene that Michael's in, and you'll see it in the teaser, every choice, I mean, you'll see it in the teaser of episode one, every choice that he makes for the words that we wrote, I know is informed by this brilliant backstory, and it just makes the whole scene sing. Um, and we wouldn't have gotten that if we didn't have an actor we did in Michael. So everyone, mm -hmm. it's just a collaboration. That's a boring way of saying it, but everyone, everyone helps heighten the material for, for sure. Yeah. And to that point as well, one of the gifts of, of coming back for a subsequent season is that at this point, you do know what those strengths in each of your actors are, you know, and you've seen how they uniquely inhabit the role and perhaps have brought a perspective to a character in certain ways that you hadn't even maybe anticipated as, as writers who developed them. And so has that shifted the way that you've crafted the perspective or any of the details or any of the places that you're pushing these characters to at this point, now that you have that rapport with the cast and you really know where they can push it to absolutely i think that we're always listening to them and that you know mm -hmm. and kind of looking at just like what's really working and then we kind of like lean into that and we want to explore that area and then sometimes we'll come up with an idea that's the, that's the one thing that like we have to do is that like well sometimes you have an idea and you're like oh that's going to affect things that we had already worked out and now we got to go back and change stuff and you just like reach out to them and be like we have an idea for a twist on that or what if you did know this person in the past you know, and so that allows us to kind of like, you know, that flexibility, because like in network TV, sometimes we're like making this up on the plot, you know, we're making it up only a couple, a couple of days or a couple of weeks ahead of production. So it's like being able to go back and go like, hey, we want to make this shift. It's like our team is able to do that. And so often it was like, I mean, like when we were doing the MF finale, I mean, this is, this is a testament to just how, what a professional Dermot is. It's like, we were able to, I was able to call him on the day and be like, hey man, we're turning this into t these two episodes into these two things. He's like, I saw the pages, I know what you're doing. It's gonna be great, you know? And it's like, that's, that's, it's like, we're all storytellers too. It's like, that's the other thing too about like, especially network TV or also TV is like, you're a storyteller along with the actors. And if they can understand, like if you're, even if you've made a change in regard to like a part of the story because you have, you're out of time or whatnot, if you give them the information it allows them as storytellers as well to work with you to kind of go like, okay, I know how to execute that and, you know, and help you make this story all kind of come together. And I also feel like it would be remiss not to talk about the father-son relationship within the show as well, because that's obviously such a central pivotal point to the entire existence of the show to begin with. And 
you know, not to kind of dampen it, but there's almost like a will they, won't they dynamic to like the push and pull between the two of them and, and their relationship and the, the way that Malcolm tries to pull himself away, tries to extricate himself, but almost ends up back there. And, you know, at the same time, there's there's a certain amount of times that you can do that with an audience before they start to mm -hmm. feel like it's a repeated pattern. So how mm -hmm. do you kind of look at that push and pull between them and, and the different places that their relationship reaches and and figure out when it can hit each of those beats and how much you can play with like that swing back and forth between the two of them. It's it's fun that you say will they won't they which is like always a love story yeah. sort of trope but we're talking about a father and son but what I think is fun is that we can play will they won't they but we can also play the power dynamics that come along with a father-son relationship and what is Bright able to hold over his father? What is it? You know, we saw last season, um, you know, we, we just saw what Martin can do with a little bit of power, you know, especially in the, uh, the Eye of the Needle episode 14 with the, the killer. But so we're, we're able to play a lot of those different dynamics with the two of them. And, and, and the way to keep it fresh, I think, is just always to keep it honest. Like know that they can't always be mad at each other and they can't, you know, and they, sometimes they're actually gonna have good moments. You know what I mean? Because that, that's the craziest part about this character we have in The Surgeon mm -hmm. is that he's a serial killer. But I think when Chris and I think about him, we think about him as a good dad first mm -hmm. and a serial killer second. And because he is a good dad first, it's like, it's hard not to love him sometimes in the will they won't they and and that I I I fear for when people are going to grow tired of that relationship but I'm still very fascinated by it because I think we we, we there's so many more places that we can take that father son dynamic and and that we are taking it this season for sure yeah on, on a separate side, I was really interested in how as showrunners you work with the different directors coming into the series and, you know, now you have the opportunity to start having recurring directors who know the world that you've created, but you're really kind of like taking your baby and handing it over to these directors at the end of the day once it comes to actually filming the scenes. So how do you work with them and communicate with them to, and what sort of conversations do you like to have and tools do you like to give them to ensure that what they're executing is really the vision that you have in mind when you're first working on these scripts? I think there's a couple things that you know you realize is that when you're in TV you know in television and movies is that you're you're dependent on your director it's like these are not director proof uh, this is not a director proof show mm -hmm. we need a director who's going to come in with an actual real vision for the show and so we always push our directors to kind of go like there's 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 maybe certain things that we do and like that we definitely lean on the look of the show we have an amazing cinematography team so the, the show looks fantastic, but we also want our directors to bring their own personal style to it because this is a thriller. And I, when you think of thrillers, they've always been tied to their director, be it Verhoeven or Hitchcock or, or even um, um, you know Ryan Johnson of Knives Out on your coffee cup. Mm -hmm. It's like you have to have like you, you, so we re we rely on our directors like go for the cool shot, make us look brilliant and smart as writers by bringing that kind of you know directorial vision to it. So we really want to empower our directors. To kind of like bring um, to bring their A game and also to like push it, push the show, go for it. The worst thing we can see is is something where it's boring or it's just like traditional. And in, in our show, it's very much we're looking for our, our directors to kind of put on their Hitchcock hat and mm -hmm. kind of go like to go for it. And well, and I, my, my, oh, I was just going to add to that my favorite phone call. We our line producer in New York, you know, he's in charge of the budget for every episode. And he's this, he, Jason Sokolov, he's amazing. My favorite phone call we get from him is when he calls us and in this thick Brooklyn accent, he's like, this director's asking for a lot. They're asking for a crane, they're asking for, makes me so happy. Chris and I are like, yes, great. They're on the right track. When a director doesn't ask for anything, I get very worried. Cause I'm like, come on guy, we, we wanna, we wanna, or, you know, we wanna push you here. So Lisa Robinson is, pre is prepping an episode for us right now, I actually just, came from a Zoom from her and she did, uh, she did a wonderful episode for us last season. And it's like, I know that I can tell just by the emails that she's pushing it real hard. And it's like, yeah, that's good. Like, yeah, get that, you know, keep pushing that. Let's get that crate, fight for it. That, that's what we always want to see. 
And you have Lou Diamond Phillips directing an episode this season mm -hmm. as well. What's that experience in working with him as a collaborator, as a director, as opposed to a cast member, and all the things that he is able to bring to the table because he know he not only knows his character, he knows every single character on that show really intricately from all of the interactions and all the scenes that he's played and has such a, a unique and in-depth understanding of this world that you've created already. Yeah, you get out of his way. You, you get out of his way and let him do his thing. It's like, he knows what he's doing. It's like, Lou's fantastic. I mean, here, here's the thing. When you have an actor who is also a director, but also not only, you know, this isn't a, this is a Lou's first, Lou's, you know, is, is a veteran director who, who's, who knows, and has done so many shows that like, you let the expert do his thing. And, and, and I could think that he gets the feeling from us and the, and we, the same thing we tell all of our directors is to push it and to go for it. And he is, excited and stoked it's like you know we get we get hand drawings from him you know texted yeah. to us like i drew up some ideas here and, and it's like that is the thing that we get jazzed about which is like you know it's like when someone's like got a, a crazy idea or a scrawl you know something they got they, they had a dream last night that's fantastic for us because one of the things about like when you're doing 13 episodes you know or or especially 22 episodes of tv Somebody has got to be so excited for the thing you're doing, thing you're doing that day. Like if you're ever just doing like cops walking down the street, it's like you're done for. Whereas like if somebody's out there going like we're doing this crazy ass thing, and that's what that's what that's what excites us. And so we're, we're very lucky to have Lou um, directing and also just like and his weird scribblings coming in, you know, at, at, at odd hours on email. Yeah. Chris isn't lying. It's really amazing. The, the episode takes place in the world of high-end plastic surgery. And you can imagine how, how gothic and, and grotesque that can get. But I did wake up to, a, to, to, to some drawings that, and lose an amazing artist. That's the crazy thing. It was like, it was jarring on so many different levels. But I can't wait for that one. That's going to that's gonna be a killer. Me either. And you mentioned before that this is a show that really just kind of continues to push itself forward and, and to push itself into new spaces. What are the ways in which for season two that you both feel like you've not only pushed yourselves forward and out of your comfort zone, but also the show itself and, and this world that you've created? I don't know. I, I think we're still pushing ourselves. I mean, we still want to find new areas and also mm -hmm you know, you know, break our structure a couple of times. And like, there was always, there was points last year, like in our episode 11, Alone Time, we were like, it's just bright in this guy in a room. Is this going to work? And it did, and it was great. And I think that so long as we find ourselves owning the thing that we want to do, you know, it's like, we just, you know, we just kind of drive toward it. And so I think the only thing that, you know, it's like, I just wish I had more time this season to spend more time with these, these characters. And, uh, you know, it's like, this has, you know, at 13 episodes, we've had to tighten up a little bit and kind of like, you know, condense the story that we intended to do in season two. But that, that's not a bad thing. It's just made us, you know, kind of focus and be very kind of judicial about um, which stories we tell. I mean, it's also just the way we're pushing ourselves. It's like, you can turn on Trevor Noah or Seth Meyers. And it's like, oh, they're filming from their bedroom. That makes sense. It's a pandemic. If you turn on Prodigal Son and it doesn't look exactly like Prodigal Son, you're going to turn it off. You're not going to be like, oh, it's a pandemic. I get it. The sound guy couldn't come in that day. So the way we're pushing ourselves, I think, is that it looks exactly like our show. And we're, we're doing it, you know, um, with two hands and a foot tied behind our back, but we're doing it safely and we're getting it done. And we're, um, the show's still going to look and feel exactly like our show, which I can't... Um, I don't know, that's what was keeping me up a few months ago, but now that we're getting episodes and we're getting cuts, knock on wood, that's, um, I don't know, that's, I'm proud of a lot of people and who have been able to make that happen. It's very impressive. It, it, it comes down to our crew, it comes down to our director. The first two episodes is directed by the incredibly talented Antonio Negrete, who is just an incredible visual stylist. And like he is, the first episode is, is everything and the kitchen sink filled with blood. And the second episode is our exorcism episode, which is just outright batshit crazy and should not work. And the fact that it does is just a, test, a testament to Antonio and Eileen, the writer, uh, Eileen Jones, the writer. So it's a, um, and then and then we have just like, you know, baller directors lined up after that, you know, and uh, so we can't be, you know, we couldn't be more excited. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see all of this season. And, and I also hope that you're able to be back in an in-person writer's room with all of the snacks and, and lunches that you want. <laughs> Thank you so much for chatting with us this afternoon.
A pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.